how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about schizophrenia, talk a little bit about some of the major players in the early history of schizophrenia. Um, but to get started on a little introduction to schizophrenia, um, although we discuss schizophrenia as if it's a single disease, realistically it's comprised of a bunch of different disorders with different etiologies. Um, we see patients who have completely different presentations, different treatment responses, and even the course of illness varies across patients. When we consider the fact that there's been hundreds to thousands of different genes that have been identified as contributory to schizophrenia, we can see that a patient can have a completely different set of genes, completely different set of symptoms, uh, but they're still grouped under the label of schizophrenia. And the signs and symptoms are very variable. Um, that includes changes in perceptions, emotions, cognition, thinking, and behavior. And I know that's really vague, but hopefully as we go more into the videos, um, we'll have a better picture of what schizophrenia looks like. I think it's important that uh, people appreciate that the diagnosis is based entirely on history and just the mental static exam, so the patient in front of you. Um, there's no lab test that exists. There's no sort of imaging that exists. Um, right now, there's a big push that, you know, that we see different neurological changes in imaging, but that's really only when you look at groups of patients. And I am not hopeful that in the near future, we'll be able to do kind of a, any sort of test or brain scan that will tell us whether or not someone has or doesn't have schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is one of the most common serious mental diseases, and the exact nature of schizophrenia is still really largely unknown. You know, we see things like the dopamine hypothesis, where uh, it's like aberrant dopamine, but the thing is that mostly comes from what we see in terms of treatment response. So we saw that antipsychotics treated schizophrenia, and we saw that the antipsychotics blocked dopamine. It's less of, you know, the serious understanding of what's actually going on. So the big push in modern day psychiatry is to believe that most psychiatric conditions are biological in nature. Um, I don't really drink the biology, psychiatry, Kool-Aid, but I do think of schizophrenia as one of the conditions that has definitively a biological etiology. And as we see more and more things get pushed into diagnoses, um, sometimes some of them are a little bit questionable. Schizophrenia is one of those things that is not questionable. Um, we see examples of schizophrenia kind of all throughout history. Early Greek physicians described delusions of grandeur, paranoia, and deterioration in cognitive function and personality, but it wasn't really until the 19th century that it emerged as a medical condition worth treating. So here I just want to talk about the major early players in schizophrenia and our understanding of schizophrenia. One of the first people to give a name to schizophrenia was a French psychiatrist named Benedict Morel, and he used the term dimanche precoche to describe deteriorated patients whose illness began in adolescence. So this leads us to Emile Kreplin, who's one of the big, super early names in schizophrenia, and he translated Morel's dimanche precoche into dementia precox, and that translates to premature dementia, so dementia, just the dementia that we know of, and precox meaning premature. And this term really emphasized the changes in schizophrenia that we see in cognition that reflects the dementia and then the early onset of the disease, which is precox, so the early onset relative to dementia. And these patients were described as having a long-term deteriorating course and clinical symptoms of hallucinations and delusions. So he distinguished these subset of patients from patients who had a distinct period of illness alternating with periods of normal functioning. So today we think of that as uh, bipolar illness, and back then it was classified as manic depressive psychosis. He also distinguished schizophrenia from another separate condition he called paranoia, and that was characterized by persistent persecutory delusions. And these patients lacked the deteriorating course of dementia precox, and, but, and then compared to the other illness, they lacked the intermittent symptoms of the manic depressive episodes. So Kreplin identified three subtypes of schizophrenia. He had hebephrenic, catatonic, and paranoid. And hebephrenic uh, is similar to what we call today disorganized schizophrenia, and disorganized schizophrenia was in the ICD-10 until uh, 2022. And today, the subtypes of schizophrenia are kind of losing favor, which I think is really unfortunate because we kind of only have the main label of schizophrenia to use, which I think is, as I mentioned earlier, because there's these different subtypes, it's really missing the, the nuance between all the different conditions that are characterized by schizophrenia. So Kreplin also emphasized the biological basis of schizophrenia. So he believed there was a specific neuropathological process that was going wrong. And this is in comparison to people who believe that all mental illness can be explained by psychological problems. 
Kreplin also played a big role in emphasizing the importance of longitudinal observation of patients to understand their illness, and then using descriptive pathology, so studying the different signs and symptoms of mental disorders. And that was a big influence on the development of standardized diagnostic criteria. And today we see like the DSM, DSM-5. The next big player in schizophrenia is Eugene Pluler. And he actually coined the term schizophrenia, and he replaced dementia precox as the main term to describe these patients. And he chose the term schizophrenia to express the schisms of thought and emotion and behavior in these patients. So schizo means split, and then phren means mind. So he's kind of just saying split mind. And this term is often misconstrued by lay people to mean split personality. Um, split personality is actually a different disorder that we now call dissociative identity disorder, and it completely differs from schizophrenia. Another contribution of Bluler was what we call the four A's. Um, so he identified what he thought were primary symptoms of schizophrenia to develop his theory about the mental schisms of these patients. So the four A's are associational disturbances of thought, um, especially looseness of thought, leading to logical and incoherent speech. And then affective disturbances, so inappropriate or flattened emotional responses. Autism, and he's using the word a little differently than how we use it now, but he, he's referring to the withdrawal from reality and a schizophrenic patient's preoccupation with their inner fantasies. And then the last one is ambivalence, so simultaneous experiences of conflicting emotions and desires. So he also identified uh, secondary symptoms, which were the symptoms that Kreplin saw as the major indicators of his formulation of dementia precox. And so they were talking about hallucinations and delusions. And he acknowledged that these symptoms were also prominent, but he considered them less essential to the diagnosis than the fundamental symptoms that he considered the four A's. He also acknowledged that the schizophrenia exists on a continuum. So he didn't think it was a single discrete entity, but a spectrum of related conditions. And he proposed that there's various degrees of schizophrenia ranging from mild to severe, and they can manifest in, in different ways. He also acknowledged more so than Kreplin that there were psychological factors at play. Um, so he felt that early life experiences and psychodynamic processes also contributed to uh, the, the schizophrenia developing and then how it played out. Mm -hmm.